Welcome to this webinar from the Eastman School of Music. I'm Julia Figueres. I am the midday host and the music director for WXXI Classical. And today we are celebrating the release of Aquarelles on Bridge Records with the many people who made it possible, starting with musicians. I would like you to meet flutist Bonita Boyd, cellist Stephen Doan, and pianist Barry Snyder. Hello and welcome to all of us. We have you here. There you are. Congratulations on this marvelous new CD. Bonnie, how did the project get started? Well, we've been playing the three of us together off and on for uh, many years, more than 30 probably, and known each other and collaborated for, for just a very long time. And we just all felt that now's the time to make this recording of the repertoire we've played for so long that we've enjoyed most of most of what's on the CD and some of it's new. So Stephen, how did you actually choose the repertoire that you would put on the CD? Well, I think I have to take off my hat to Bonnie because she did some beautiful choices and was the chief planner, planner in chief here, I think. But uh, I had played the Martin and we played the Weber a number of times and I believe in Martin also, but the the, the uh, Gobert is new to me, uh, and it's a bit of a, it's a mini masterpiece, it's a lovely piece. And uh, so we, when we heard a bit of uh, samples of what, what Bonnie was proposing, we jumped on board with delight. Now, it, it's an unusual combination, cello, piano, and flute. Barry, is there a lot of music out there for this trio, this kind of uh, instrumentation? You know, I don't know. Bonnie would know better. Uh, I've done some, uh, but this is sort of like core. Well, what's on the CD, I think it's probably core uh, This for this group. Um, Gobert was new to me. I didn't know Gobert at all. It's gorgeous music. Uh, but Martinu, I knew a bit, and certainly Weber. Uh, and Bonnie and I have done a whole bunch of things, too, you know, for, for flute. And, so I know some of that, but trios, I don't know so much. I haven't done a lot. So I think that makes the CD kind of interesting because it's not repertoire you hear so often. Right. Well, so, flutists play it a lot, of course. Flutists no, go ahead, Bonnie. Oh, flutists play all this all the time. So it's probably not known as much to the general audiences, but the Von Weber is a mainstay in our repertoire and the Martin New is too. And then there are many other pieces for this combination, but but we kind of think some of these are the better ones, or at least the ones we're enjoying at the moment. So how do you then, you put this concept together, did you then go label shopping? Did you go directly to Bridge? How did you decide, Steve, you're laughing, you get to talk. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> well, first thing we did was try to get a good performance going and then record it. And then, uh, then we wanted to see who was interested. And we were very, very fortunate that Bridge Records, which is a fantastic label and has a huge range of offerings that they were willing to take us on. So uh, how long did it take you to, to get all the music for the CD in place where you said, okay, now we're ready to put it on, on vinyl to, to make it permanent for all time? Bonnie? Well, we played the Von Weber, as I say, probably over 30 years. Uh, many, many performances of that and, and several of the Martinu. And so for us, it was music that was already in our hearts. <clears throat> but then we had a concert um, shortly before the recording was made, live concert and, and performed all of this, obviously. And then we had to go by, by our tremendous producer's schedule as well. And when he could get to Rochester and we could, we could spend a week putting this, putting this um, CD together. All right, so you played it as a concert. What is the difference between playing this music in an, for an audience and in a concert and playing it with no audience there in Hatch Recital Hall or a recording? Did you find that, Barry, you had to play differently? Of course. I think, I think always there's always sort of a shadow there that when, when you know there's a microphone there listening carefully, you figure, Gosh, your third finger wasn't as strong as you thought it was. <laughs> you know, and and then, uh, but of course, you know, even in the concert, you have to worry about the hall. And and we, all, all three of us, have played a lot in Kilburn and Hatch. And Hatch is newer to us, and it's a different kind of hall. Both beautiful, different. So of course, yeah, you have to make adjustments. And uh, when the hall is smaller, of course, then uh, 
you're playing to the last row is different. You know, and all that, the energy and the personality, all that begins to shift. And then there are three of us with personality. So it, it, it creates some interesting challenges, but fun. Now we're going to be talking to your sound engineer and your producer very shortly, but why don't you talk to us a little bit about the difference between playing for a mic and playing for an audience. Bonnie? Yes, I, I think I could say a lot about that. It's so radically different for flute. If, if everything in my training and my, my entire career is has been for a hall and to get to the last row, that's what we do. You know, we 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 practice for years to have this kind of a sound that's gonna to get to the last person in the last row and it and create this this enormous um, range in our playing of of dynamic range, color range, everything that's all gonna get out there. So so we're that's everything. And when I first began to record many years ago, I found it tremendously challenging because when I played that way for the hall, I overshot the mic, you know, it just, just made everything very, very difficult. So we distort, it's very hard with flute when we get it up very high, it can distort very easily. So if we push too hard, does it really work? And then, then the mic, you know, trying to get, I bet Rich could talk about this later and Tom too, but trying to get a balance between what they call the hall sound and the close-up sound is, is a real struggle. And I wish we could just have mics in the hall and forget about close-up. <laughs> but with the close-up mic, you hear everything, you know, your breathing, the keys, everything. And I'm sure that the other two could say things about that too. So it, it really is very, very different. What about the internal balance uh, with, it's a great combination, flute, cello, and piano, beautiful timbres, but Barry, how is this playing different than say you were in a piano trio, um, you, the balance for you as a pianist? Well, Bonnie hit on it a bit. I mean, the, the sound of the flute, which is gorgeous, particularly when Bonnie plays it, uh, as you go up higher, she has to figure out how soft she can afford to play or it won't sound. On the piano, we can go up and just keep playing and then just be soft. <laughs> and we don't have anything to do with that. So, I mean, uh, so that, uh, let's say the flute has higher overtones to work with, cello has other overtones to work with. And then often we double or we are the orchestra or we are whatever. So we have to figure out our role, first of all, if we're accompanying, if we're doing more interplay between cello and flute, where, where do we put our sound? And if we play a chord, we obliterate them. You know, I mean, an eight eight note chord could obliterate both. So if we have eight notes, then it's probably an orchestral eight eight note chord. Then we have to voice it in a way that doesn't cover them or even double them. So there is that challenge, of course. And uh, it's it's a fun challenge when we have, like Bonnie and Steve. It's always fun because it's on an upper level. But when you get some that are not so good, oh boy, it's, it's <laughs> going. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Steve? Well, when the concert is over, it's wonderful. But when the recording is not over, you have to do it again, unfortunately. So, That's very it's, true. It's true. We have to keep refining balances. And I, I just have to say that Barry's a bit of a genius at voicing. Um, but we would we would have to experiment because, as Bonnie said, when you're playing to the hall, you judge, even the voicing is judged differently because uh, the cello has a fragile middle register and strong top and um, bottom registers and so when you're interweaving with the piano in a hall sometimes you end up overplaying the middle register in order to get enough projection but it, at the close mic it's like if you were uh, close to an actor you would hear the elocution almost painfully you know how they say if you're in the front row in a theater you almost get some saliva on your <laughs> on your program and and uh, the difficulty with playing for a mic for a string player is that the surface noise that we accept when we're playing in a hall is is uh, and even the finger drop or our breathing because it tends to become aerobic when it's strenuous playing um, all of these processes become apparent um, under the close mic so you're trying to balance uh, your training with what you know is possible and uh, it's it is a big challenge but sometimes you can get an incredible amount of detail after you keep at it for a while we had some real laughs though when we were trying to find our way into that that situation yeah. did any of you sit in on the editing at all or the mixing down of it 
we sat in on some of the editing and some Tom did at a distance. A lot he did at a distance. And then and then we did some work with Rich too here. So what did you think of Aquarelles the first time you heard the finished project? I know that some musicians accept it and some musicians cringe. So are you, Steve, a cringer or an acceptor? Well, it went through a process of, of the first edits that we got from Tom were mostly the close mic. So you could hear all the slight exaggerations that you have to do for an acoustic. So that was a shock. I mean, that was very educational, but it was also a bit, it was, I suppose it was a bit cringe making because you could hear the kind of in physical enthusiasm that it takes. Mm -hmm. And then as they, as they started to mix the close mics with what the hall was getting, then you got more and more uh, acoustical reward and you could, I could start to recognize what we'd been doing as it traveled into the space that we were playing in. It's, it's kind of tricky because the close mics do put you under a microscope. I'm, don't mean to make a pun, but there I am. Um, so it's it's uh, it's a it is a it's an odd. It changes your perspective from a, a, a more a global to very local. Um, so in the in the listening to edits, that was something of a distraction for me anyway, because I I couldn't always hear the group sound in the way that I did eventually. Um, but it was also very very fascinating to to hear how that all fits together. Rich can talk much more about that in technical terms. What about you, Barry? Were you pleased with what you heard? Be honest with you, I haven't heard the finished product, so I don't know. <laughs> so I have no opinion. But uh, what Steve was saying, I, I may bring up something that uh, usually when I'm playing chamber music and it's like a trio or a quartet, I like the group a bit farther away from the piano than most because I like to make the blend of my sound coming from the hall, not on stage. Because I found if I'm too close, I either overplay or underplay. When I hear my sound coming from the hall, I feel I can adjust better to who is playing in front of me. So in this case, um, they were not so far away, a little further than usual. But there was a nine-foot piano, which is maybe too big for Hatch to begin with. So it was very bright, and they're far away. <laughs> so you get the picture. It's it's a juggling act. But I mean, I'm, I'm used to it a bit. But it it does cause some some nervousness, shall we say. Uh, but it, it's it's an interesting kind of thing because then then the blend is different, you know, than than if we're all trying to blend on the stage. And of course where you place the piano on the stage also makes a difference in the blend a lot too. And, and Bonnie, are you happy with the C D? Oh yes. I, I I think our our producer and our audio engineer just did fantastic work. <laughs> We did okay. We played, <laughs> but they helped. Well, the, I, Barry, I think you misspoke because you and I listened here at, at, at the house when you were up in Rochester to one of the later edits uh, when they put oh. things together. And, oh, and I think we were both pretty pleased with the sound. And you could yeah. hear, um, and Rich, you'll tell us where that was in the stage, in the mixing stage, but we were listening to the close mics mixed with the hall mics. And that's where you start to get the concert experience that they're going for in the, in the mixing. Well, we're going to talk to the men behind the dials coming right up next in this uh, webinar. And if you're watching this webinar, as you're watching it, there is a Q&A button that you can push. So if you have a question you'd like to toss in, we'll try to get to you. I think that right now we can sit back and listen to a little bit of your new CD. This is the first movement of Philippe Gobert's Three Aquarelles with Bonnie Boyd, Stephen Doan, and Barry Snyder.
That was the first movement of Philippe Gobert's Three Aquarelles. It's from a brand new bridge recording called Aquarelles with Bonnie Boyd, Stephen Doan, and Barry Snyder. And the wonderful animation was by Hendrik Soderstrom. And we're going to meet him in just a little bit. I'm Julia Figueres, and I would like to introduce you to the guys in the sound booth. Uh, as I uh, mentioned, you will meet them, sound engineer Rich Wadi and producer Thomas Moore. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we, this was recorded in Hatch Recital Hall, and one of the features of the hall is that it can be tuned. So what exactly does that mean, Rich? I want to share my screen with you and show you a few things. Okay, so um, hi, I'm Rich Wadi. I'm an audio engineer here at the Eastman School of Music, and I am showing you right now Hatch Recital Hall. This is a really cool three-dimensional version of it um, that's available on the Eastman website. And I'll drop a link to that in the chat so that you can check out our hall as well as our Hatch Hall as well as the other halls there. And uh, yeah, so the hall's a variably acoustic. It, it has variable acoustic mechanical curtains. So behind the rattan walls in the back, there's a concrete wall that's very reflective to sound. So it, it makes it very reverberant when the curtains are completely deployed, we call them, so that when they're not in the way. Or if you bring all the curtains up, then it sounds a lot muddier, um, or not muddier, but darker sounding. So it, it changes the uh, acoustic reverb time in the hall. Um, and so that, that's what those mechanical curtains are about. I'm sorry, I just kind of made a presentation, Julia, and you're, you're asking me great questions. Not a problem. So uh, the difference between doing this in a hall with an audience and doing it in a hall without an audience can be made up. Uh, with those baffles, those sound curtains that you adjust. They, they can, and we experimented um, quite a bit at the beginning of this recording session to try um, not only different staging, uh, we ended up pushing them further apart uh, to get a little more separation between the instruments so we'd have a little more finer control of the final product. Um, but also we adjusted the, the curtains, we tried it with them in the middle, we tried it closed, and we eventually opened them all the way up because we love that really reverberant sound. Um, and, and that's what we ended up going with. I, I think it's nice for the performers because they can hear all that sound coming back at them from the hall, even though we're capturing a, a close mic that maybe isn't picking up the hall reverberation. Uh, it's still nice for the performers to play in that big, big open hall. So Bonnie and Barry and uh, Steve and I were talking about the different timbres of this trio. Uh, does that create a, a set of challenges for you as the audio engineer? Well, sure, and that brings us to microphones. Um, microphones are like my paint brushes, and I, I want to show you a couple of these. This is a, a large diaphragm that I used on the cello. Um, this is a, a small diaphragm chef's microphone. It's very accurate and very fast. As I'm not speaking into a microphone, you're probably not hearing me. Um, and this is a, a Royer's ribbon microphone. And, and Thomas Moore actually he hipped me to these AEA N8s, and Thomas, look, we got a pair. These are a great pair of um, really wonderful sounding uh, ribbon microphones. So we use these different types of mics, and I actually have a couple clips of the different mics, if you don't mind me showing you those. Sure. Um, this is uh, some solo, I'm going to solo just the chef's So it's very, uh, there's a lot of attack to it. And then we're going to show you as well the, the 414. This is a large diaphragm. It'll be a bit more uh, beefy sounding. And those are both the close microphones. Um, for flute, here's the ships. And then we're going to switch over to the ribbon microphone, which is a bit darker sounding on, on the flute. So I'll, I'll stop sharing. Um, 
And uh, so we, we've got some different colors that we can uh, grab or capture directly at the microphones. And then we also had distant microphones in the hall that are gonna pick up more of the reverberation. And of course, uh, everything was equal power. So when the first edit went out, what they heard was mostly the close mics. And then once we mixed it, then we brought the close mics way down in volume and used a lot more of the hall sound. Um, and we actually kind of went up and down with different mics depending on like if Bonnie's in a high timbre or a high pitch, um, it's so much louder and so much brighter than her low note. So we actually kind of created different scenes for each microphone and we, we moved them around in order to hopefully make it all sound really transparent and like you're really there in the hall. So Tom, as the pieces were being played and recorded, what were you listening for? Well, thank you for having me. This is uh, really a pleasure to be part of this crew. Well, thank and you for being here. Absolutely. Um, so my my job as a producer is to oversee the, everything musical um, in the production, um, going from helping with input to sound uh, to um, interpretation, uh, helping to coach the musicians through um, certain passages, um, helping that, being their ears for them. And my, my first job is really to take away, um, my first job is to let them perform and not be thinking about anything else except performing. So um, I have to gain their trust very quickly and let them know I know what I'm doing and I've got, the, I've got their back. So when I'm listening, I have the, um, the score in front of me and what I'm listening for specifically are things like um, ensemble, um, intonation, articulation, um, and also for musical gesture. So um, there's sometimes there's there are musical gestures that happen that um, you know maybe we need to make a little bit larger because in the world of CDs nobody can see you play. So on stage a gesture with your body may mean something to the audience, but if you can't see that, we need to put that into the music. So um, yeah, things like that. So I'm keeping track of that uh, in my score. Um, I've got a sort of a- Are you along in the score? Pardon me? You have a score in front of me, uh, in front of you as they're playing? Oh yes, yes. I've got a score in front of me and I have um, a take sheet and, so I'm keeping track of, for each take, I'm keeping track of what is contained, what music is contained in that take. So take five is from letter B to letter C, for example. And as the music is going, as, as the music is being performed, I'm following in the score and I'm making marks in my score so that I know exactly if there's a problem area or if it's really great. I also mark in if I, if I think something really is compelling um, and grabs my attention, that's what, um, you know, I want to remember that. So um, then I have to basically what they call map the score, which is put all the pieces parts together so that in the editing process, I already know. So by the time I leave the recording, I'm, I'm a, a type of producer that has a score pretty well mapped by the time I leave the recording um, so that I can start the editing process and put everything together. And if during that process, I find that, um, oh, there's something that I didn't quite catch at the session, I can look in the score and see, okay, but a take take 33 here was really good too. So I can I can put that in there. So are the are the musicians not playing the piece from first note to last? They're playing it in chunks? No, a lot of times we what we what I like to do is have a performance. But the goal here is always to capture the performance, right? And um I think we have all heard overly edited and overly fussed with recordings and, and all the humanity it's taken out of those recordings. So what I go for is in my style is to have a, a performance, just a straight through performance and then um, have the musicians come and listen. Um, and you know that there's no greater teacher than hearing yourself, right? Um, it's a very not many of us have the opportunity as musicians to hear 
um, ourselves in this way. And our, our great trio, you know, they know exactly what they need to do once they hear it, you know. So um, it affords them the opportunity to hear that and make the adjustments on their own. And then we go back and we, we start at the beginning and then we sort of start working our way through it. And at the end, you know, if we had time, we would do another straight through pass of it, for example, because by that time, all the coaching and all of the details have been worked out. And it's a chance for everyone just to sort of uh, sit back and relax and just, just do a performance straight through. Because so Sir George Schulte was really famous for leaving mistakes in. He, he really liked, he preferred the passion of the performance over perfection. So how perfect should a recording be? No, that's a very interesting question, Julia. And I think it depends on the artist and the producer and the record labels and all that kind of stuff. And we have to remember when uh, Sir George Schulte was recording, a lot of times they were recording to tape. So they didn't have the... Um, uh, the, 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 what we can do in the digital realm is, is quite amazing. So we can, we can make it pretty perfect. But it's funny because when you played that first movement there, I, I was reminded of um, there's, a, there's a dissonance in that first movement. I think it's between the flute and the piano. And I would, every time we went by it, I would look down at the score to say, that, is that right? Are those the right notes? And, and, uh, you know, on, on a consultation with Bonnie and everybody else, it was like, that's what he wrote. It's not always performed that way because it sounds wrong and some people change it so that it is, it's not a dissonant thing. But we made the decision specifically to put it in there. So, um, you know, I think there's, of course, the main goal is to capture the passion of the performance and, uh, but we also do have to, um, because we can, and we have the opportunity to, to fix stuff that happens. Stuff, listen, stuff happens. It just does. And it always happens in, in performances. Stuff happens, um, you know, a, a slip of a finger or just, you know, maybe something isn't precisely together. But under the, under the, the microscope of the microphone, um, we have a really unique perspective. And um, so we want to make sure that that perspective, which is more permanent than a performance, um, is delivered to the listener in a way that they can just let go and, and, and just be enveloped by the performance. Am I right in assuming, Rich and Tom, that recording an orchestra or an orchestral performance is trickier than a trio? Well, I don't know how Rich feels, but what I will say is, um, you know, I've, I've been very, had a very wonderful career um, and recorded big giant orchestras, Baroque orchestras, down to single people. And I will say the, the, the fewer performers, the harder it is <laughs> because, uh, in in a in a in a big orchestra, sometimes, you know, it gets lost in the in the big picture, you know. But with fewer performers, you really are focused in on just, you know, that individual. And for me personally, um, the fewer the numbers of performers, the more difficult it is. Rich, you're laughing. Is that true for you too? Yeah, I, th I think it's almost easier to record larger ensembles. It's easier to make cuts. Everything kind of blends a little more. And with solo players, I mean, with a trio, it's like you have three soloists and they all have very specific timbres. And for them to go from, you know, take one to take two, they're not necessarily going to play it exactly the same and it may not edit as easily so you may have to go to take three in order to get that edit or specifically go for it so yeah it's probably easier for for larger ensembles actually you just push the faders up and it's a big wall of sound <laughs> so uh what pleases each of you most about this cd aquarelles well, I, I could jump in on that. I think the clarity of it, um, I, I feel like it really is, is musical and, and Thomas did a great job of pulling out the music from what technically we did to capture it. Um, I feel like it's really clear. Tom? Well, I, I think, um, the, you know, it's always like, um, you know, 
birthing a project when you hear the final, you know, the final result. And I think I love listening to that. I really do. I love listening to this CD. I can't say that about everything that I do. Um, but I think, you know, working with these musicians who have such a, a rich history together and capturing the the colors of, you know, um, the colors that they could, you know, pull out of their instruments and their imagination just really draws you into, into each performance. And I mean, for, on a personal note, I, I felt extremely honored to, um, to work with Rich and to be at the Eastman School and, uh, you know, work in that beautiful hall and to be sort of like invited into the clubhouse to play for a little while. I made some great friends along the way and I think we have a really beautiful recording. You do have a really beautiful recording and I congratulate both of you on the work that you did to help with uh, the beauty of this recording. And, and I'm really grateful that you were able to be part of this uh, webinar. But I think now we should go back to that beautiful CD and give a little listen with the Adagio for Bogoslav Mark News Trio for Flute, Cello and Piano.
a very beautiful and evocative second movement or part of it, a Bohuslav Montanus trio for flute, cello, and piano. It was played by Bonita Boyd, Stephen Doan, and Barry Snyder from their new CD, Aquarelles. The animation was done by Henrik Soderstrom, who is one of our next guests. And joining Henrik is Marjorie Roth. And Henrik, uh, there you are. Uh, you not only did all the animations for this webinar, but your painting is also the cover art. So congratulations. You actually have a very personal connection to this uh, project. A little, yeah. Oh, admit it, <laughs> say it now. <laughs> yeah, Benita Boyd is my mom. Um, so it's kind of amazing that the sound of the flute, I, like I grew up hearing it, especially in the morning. It's like etched in my memory of like, like her practicing in the morning. And just as a, as a kid hearing that, that all the time, I think it still hits this kind of like really deep chord, that sound, um, you know, I just, I, this is connection to it. Is the cover art, was that done specifically for the CD or was it something that uh, you had and you wanted to use? Yeah, that one, and actually all the images are, are, um, are all different paintings that are sort of mashed up. Um, so I sort of treat the studio like a compost pile and um, like cut out digitally or physically like a little bit of this painting and a little bit of that one and combine them together. Um, so everything kind of gets mixed together. So yeah, the, the cover painting was done earlier. Um, and then, uh, yeah, mom had this idea to, to, to use it for this. Mom picked it out. <laughs> oh, I see beautiful paintings behind you as well. What medium do you tend to work in? All different. I'm a little, I'm easily distracted, I think. <laughs> uh, so um, all water-based. Uh, so some acrylic and gouache and pastel. And um, there's this stuff called pumice that's like a, it's like a ground up stone. And it's in a lot of soap, like as an exfoliant. But if you like mix that in with your paint, it dries like sandpaper and you can sort of scratch on it and draw on it. Um, I had this formative teacher named Ellie Hollinshead, who's this brilliant painter in Rhode Island. And she, um, she just had this like, like delicate but aggressive way of working. Um, so a lot of that, I think, comes from her. Where was that? What school? At the Rhode Island School of Design. Oh, RISD. Good old RISD. It's a, <laughs> it's a great, great place. school. Did you enjoy? Oh, it was such a wonderful place to be. Yeah, it was a real, real privilege to be able to be there for four years. How has your artwork evolved as, from where you've started to what you're doing now? You know, I think I, I've been after some greater sense of, of mystery in the last couple of years and just trying to find, um, actually it's a lot of what is in that, that March new piece that we just heard. There's this, there's this like density of texture and then the sense that something could sort of slip through the fog at any moment, or you can like smell something and you know it's there, but you can't quite make it out yet. Um, right. So this sense of the unknown, I think is what I've been after for a little while now. And, and that's really influencing the way that I'm trying to make marks and build things up and respond to, you know, in this case, music. So, so I want to take a moment maybe to give a, a little shout out, see if your mom can, can turn on her, her video and unmute herself to stop in for just a second in this segment. <laughs> and and uh, so Bonnie, uh, the moment that Henrik said, you know, this is what I want to do for a living. What did you think about your, your, your son, the painter? Well, you know, Henrik's, Henrik's dad, my husband, was still living, too. And I remember the most hilarious thing. So when, the, when people are freshmen at Rhode Island School of Design, toward the end of that freshman year, they have to make a decision about, about what department they're going to go in to. And, and they, um, the only people who have made up their, their minds at the very beginning are the architects, right, Henrik? They, they have declared from the very first day. And then everybody else, there are 26 other departments. Do I have that right? That's, that's my Sounds memory. about right, yeah. Okay, and, and they make, the, all the departments make this presentation. So all the parents are there. And, and then all the, all the students, the new freshmen. And it's so toward the end of the year. And and the the presentations, the departments are competing for these students, and and the but the very beginning, the head of the school started with a speech. He said, "Now, if you're 
if your son or daughter says they want to do ceramics, he said, don't say, oh, but don't you want to do graphic design? <laughs> don't you want to do industrial design? Don't do that. Let them do ceramics or whatever it's going to be. And, and the parents were, if everybody was very horrified because that, those are the kind of things you think as parents, <laughs> like not a pottery shop. Oh no, <laughs> you know? we're going to go to Rose Rizzi and have a pottery shop. Why bother going there? So that was everybody's reaction, but or jewelry, things like that. They have those departments. Um, Henrik decided on furniture design. So so that was a total shock to us. Um, probably comes very naturally from the Scandinavian background, furniture making and wood. He's he loves wood, always loves all, everything, actually. Rocks, woods, you know, leaves, everything. We would pick up everything when he was young. Uh, a dead leaf, he'd say, this, this is incredibely beautiful. Look, look at how this goes. And I'm thinking, it looks like a dead leaf to me. Uh, but, but he would always see all these patterns and everything. So it's just a born in kind of thing. And yet you didn't go into furniture design, did you? <laughs> no, I had some wonderful faculty in furniture design. John Dunnigan was just this formative influence on my life. Um, but I, I feel like what that department, one thing they did a wonderful job of teaching was was responsive designing. So like like wood is this, it's a great material, but it's it's really uh, persnickety and like uncooperative. And it, it twists and warps and grows. And and I just remember these these like ways of working with that material that I learned there of um, like not trying to force something on it, but but listening to the material. And I think that there are a lot of lessons about certainly painting, but but a lot of different parts of life in that. So what do you find your inspiration in, Henry? Man, it's I, I feel like there's there's this wonder that's well, it's everywhere. <laughs> um, and it's this holiness everywhere. But I, I honestly, the natural world carries something really dynamic for me. And I think I think has for a long time. Um, and sound also, even the sounds of materials, like a good painting panel has this, you know, not like a guitar, but it has a, it has a timbre to it. And um, I think just growing up around, around so much music, um, just like physical experience and, and tactile experience and audio experience um, are, are just really great drivers. So, so you have like a website. So if somebody wants to look at your work, they can. Yeah, it's it's if you want to look it up, it's soderstrom.studio. Um, I think Rich put it in the chat. Um, All right, thank yeah. you. And, yeah. and now, if if one of the connections was Bonnie, the other of the connections is Marjorie Roth, and it's it's Bonnie again. He's just Bonnie is all over the place tonight, apparently. But Marjorie, uh, it was Bonnie that drew you into this project as well. She did. She sent me a, a lovely email and asked me if I'd be interested in writing the liner notes for this. And the way she described it to me was that she felt with her two colleagues, with Stephen Barry, that this, they had almost a family connection after all these years of playing together. And then she said, well, and of course, we've asked Kenrick to put the put the art covers for the CD. And we'd love to. This made me want to ask you to write the notes. And that was, of course, a little bit of a surprise, but really very nice. And it, it made, you know, I'm also part of the Eastman community. So it, it was a really nice family feeling, I think. Yeah, did you, you went to the Eastman School of Music, isn't that right? Oh yeah, I studied for six years with Bonnie uh, in the flute studio. And then I also at the same time, or a little bit later, but then at the same time, I also studied musicology. So these were my first, these were my two professional loves really. And the things I do now with my life, I do musicology and I do flute. And both of those things came out of some very patient and wonderful professors, including Bonnie at Eastman, who sort of helped me find, find the kind of musician I wanted to be. And this seems like a heavy load trying to do both of those things at once. Well, as I was working too at the time, but you know, when I look back at it, it was really like being in a cauldron, you know, everything was just bubbling together at the same time. And I felt really supported by Bonnie. She, she was, you know, contrary to what you might think at a, at a school like Eastman, when you come to study with an artist like Bonnie, the trajectory should be straight to the stage or the orchestra or something. But Bonnie understood, I think right away that I had a very strong interest in teaching. And I was also really drawn to music history. And she was she was really supportive all the way through as I found my way. So you had uh, the liner notes 
for composers, limited space, and for really interesting people, I might add. So how do you distill that down to the interesting bits, the salient points? How do you focus that? Well, it is true. There's a, a lot uh, that my first, actually, these were my first liner notes. So, you know, once again, Bonnie stretches me in another way. You know, this is the first, I've done a lot of things musicology wise, but this is the first time that I did any liner notes. And my first surprise was the fact that, um, liner note writers don't seem to have the same scruples about plagiarism that musicologists have, because I was quite astonished to find the same, not only the same ideas, but word for word, the same things, you know, that had been written on previous recordings for the liner notes. So what that forced me to do was take the scores and sit down and have it just be me and the scores and the composer and the piano and try to ask some questions or ask myself questions that the that came naturally from the music and then answer those questions by consulting the score so it you're right there was a there turned out to be an incredible amount of information but it was very good that david and becky gave me a word limit they said here's your word count so choose what you think makes the best narrative and that's ultimately what I what I did. But each piece, there was a lot left out <laughs> for each one of these pieces. So um, I, I would like to ask each of you what you thought about the final product when it was all finished and the project was completed and you had that thing in your hands. Uh, what did you, Henrik, think about, about Aquarelles once it was done and you could actually see it and hear it? It is a beautiful recording. I I was so energized to hear Rich and Thomas, you guys talk about the process of balancing it because it really does have, I mean, this this like deeply familiar, personal, clear sound. Um, and of course the performances are just wonderful. Like you guys, I think it maybe I'm imagining things, but I, I feel like there you can kind of hear this that these three are really great friends, you know, and just really play well together and are colleagues. And what about you, Marjorie? Well, I was just thrilled to be part of it. And I, now that I've heard the CD, of course, you know, the CD wasn't finished when I started working on the program notes. I had to work by listening to other recordings. Um, and this, and then after I wrote the program notes and I d got a copy of Bonnie's CD and I heard it, I thought, oh my goodness, there's so many more things, um, you know, that I would have liked to, to bring out in terms of this particular recording that is different. From the other ones that I heard, and as Henrik said, kind of unique, I think, to these three people. And what I in the it's interesting, the Demes piece is the title is Sonata en Concert, you know, which in the 18th century use of that en concert, it means making music together, like strong individual voices, but together. That's what that en concert means. It's kind of a togetherness. And I think you can really hear that in this recording. And it, it's just great to have been part of it. Uh, you know, let's give a listen to a bit of this Finnish project, this En Concert CD that uh, that was put together, Aquarelles. Uh, thank you each for, for being part of this and, and celebrating the CD release of Aquarelles. Uh, we're going to return to the music now and listen to uh, this Bridge Records recording. And you can find the CD, by the way, at bridgerecords.com. Uh, the uh, founders of the label are coming up next. And right now, that happy scherzo from Weber's uh, Trio for Piano, Flute, and Cello in G minor, Opus 63.
was the scherzo from Weber's trio for piano, flute, and cello with Bonnie Boyd and Stephen Doan and Barry Snyder from a brand new bridge recording, Aquarelles. And we are so pleased to have founder of Bridge Recordings joining us. Bridge Records was started 40 years ago. And today we are very happy to have the two founders of Bridge Records uh, joining us, Becky and David Starbin. Welcome. And congratulations on a really fine release. Um, you actually have a pretty long relationship with uh, with at least two thirds of this combo. Stephen Doan and Barry Snyder had a wonderful CD, a foray CD, some time ago, right? Yeah, that's among my favorite CDs. When people ask me, "What do you really like from your catalog?" and we have closing in on six hundred releases, that's among my handful of favorites. Um, it's it's a really fine version of, of those particular pieces, which happened to mean a lot to me. So, uh, yeah. And I we started recording it at Eastman in the late 80s. And um, we've made every every few years, we end up going up there, making a recording. So it's been great. Uh, what was it about Aquarelles that made you green light it? Well, um, with every project, we use our ears, we listen. Um, I happen to know these, these particular artists. When I was 18 years old, I had a very close friend, a flutist, who ended up as assistant uh, to Bonnie uh, at, at, in the Rochester Phil. And uh, she talked about Bonnie constantly. So uh, I knew Bonnie's name, I knew her work. And Steve and Barry are just um, old colleagues who, whom I've produced recordings for over the years. And, and they're just terrific, not terrific, they're great artists. And I do not use that word without some sense of what it means. They are both great artists. Bonnie is as well. And so, you know, it was an easy call. Superb. Yeah, superb. This was an easy call. Yeah, I remember uh, doing a backstage pass on, at the station with uh, Barry and Steve, and they started playing. And in my ear, I could hear our sound engineer saying, "Okay, now you're playing with the big boys." Yeah, and, and it, it's really th these are the big boys. <laughs> these are the big boys. Uh, now, how does it work at Bridge Records? Do you approach artists? Do they approach you? How are projects decided for your label? It, it happens in all sorts of different ways, really. Um, a lot of times, I, I go back to the first recording we made at Eastman. Uh, Jan Gaitani was um, ill with leukemia. She knew she didn't have that long. She wanted to make a recording of Mahler and Berlioz songs. Um, she called me, said, David, I had, I had produced a Brahms recording for another label for her. And uh, she said, are you interested? We had had the label for maybe four or five years at that point. And Jan was a hero of mine. I performed with her quite a bit. I'm a guitarist. Uh, and um, so, you know, it was, it happens like that. Someone says, there's a project, what do you think? Sometimes it happens that way. Sometimes it happens the project is completed. They send it to us. Sometimes we're sent projects that we hate and we don't do. So it, it really runs the gamut. So I, I'm assuming, and by the way, that Jan de Gaetani CD is a miracle. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a miracle. I've been playing yeah. that for a while and it, it, never, it never ceases to just astound me. How beautiful. It is. Five weeks before we made the CD, she came out of the hospital. She tried to sing a scale from, from middle C uh, up an octave. And she ended up about a, a major second flat. She could not support her sound. And this is a woman with one of the greatest ears that I've ever worked with. So she did miraculous work to, to be able to do a 70 minute program of Mahler and Berlioz in the space of five weeks. A couple of months later, she was gone. So it was, it was incredible. 
And that is probably one of the most wonderful things about recordings is that you can grab that moment and hold that moment and keep that moment eternally, yeah. which is is extraordinary. Now, I'm assuming that people come to you with projects. How many of them actually end up making making the cut? <laughs> well, <laughs> Becky is laughing. <laughs> Five percent, she says. I, you know, I mean, it might be five percent, might be a little bit less. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we get sent that isn't even the kind of material we do. So it's, uh, and we're we're essentially a classical label, although we've moved into jazz and world music over the years. But our hearts, we're, we met at conservatory when we were seventeen. So. Uh, we're, we're classical musicians. I know you play the guitar. Becky, what was your instrument? Violin. So have you ever done the duet thing together, I hope? Okay. Beyond, I mean, obviously the marriage duet thing, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, we decided that the marriage would do better without the instrumental duo. <laughs> <laughs> You know, no comment. But, but on the other hand, we work together so closely with the record company. It's life is just working together. Yeah. You know, uh, and I've been I've been in the this radio biz now for um, forty years. I started when I was ten, and um, and and I have watched as label after label after label collapses or is contracts or is sucked into another label. I mean, we're really seeing this happening at these days at an exponential rate. So what is it about Bridge Records that keeps you strong? How have you kept going for 40 years? Well, there's there's one and yeah, gray hair, but there is there is one answer that is that is the the most obvious, and I'm sure Becky would would echo this. Uh, our vice president is our firstborn, and so um, Bobby was was a, about let's see, 81. He was two years old uh, when when the company began, and by the time he was seven or eight, he was sort of early computer literate and helping us along. And uh, so, you know, as it, as it went along, he went to school, trained as a, as a medieval historian. There's no work for a medieval historian <laughs> unless you keep going to school and keep going to school. <laughs> right, and he didn't want to keep going to school. So, so he ended up in the record business with mom and dad, and he is, he's our entire digital guy. He's, he's the, in, in terms of digital distribution and all of that stuff, he's, he, he runs the company and he will keep it going after mom and dad are gone. So. You're, you mentioned you're a guitarist. Are you still doing much guitar playing, Dave? Well, I, I teach at two schools, um, Manhattan School of Music, and I'm the chair at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. So my teaching is taking up a good bit of my time. Uh, and with the virus, playing is sort of dead for all of us in terms of traveling around. So I got my vaccine two days ago. And uh, yeah, so there's, there's hope, but who knows? You, ha you actually have a bit of a connection to the Eastman School of Music. Yeah, I, I do. Um, so uh, at the time uh, they opened up a guitar, they decided to open up a guitar chair. Uh, I was one of six people who came up and auditioned. Um, I didn't get the job, Nick Galusis got the job, but I took Nick's job at Manhattan School of Music as the chair of the department. So it worked out great. I didn't have to move to the snowy Netherlands. And uh, we're well, very fond of our snowy Netherlands here. <laughs> anyway, I'm a and, New Yorker, you know, and so it's, it's like I, I got to, I'm born, I spent four years outside of New York picking up a wife. And, and aside from that, uh, you know, I'm New Yorker. So you mentioned 
the thing that we're all going through um, COVID-19 and, and what kind of impact has it had on the recording industry and, and on concerts? What is our post pandemic world going to look like? Yeah, I think we have to get to post, you know, uh, and I feel a lot better at this particular moment than I did a week ago or two months or three months ago. I don't want to get into politics, but um, I have hope that that something will happen that that, you know, but who knows? It's it's I, I have no way of knowing and, and none of us do. It's and one wonderful thing about recording during this time is it gives musicians an outlet to express themselves. Yeah. And and to get feedback through reviews and radio and I'm I'm sure Tom can can echo that that you know he's producing recordings now and uh, I'm I'm doing the same I I get to produce some recordings and I think it means more and more to people because they have less and less. And so, you know, this is our chance to really speak and, and reach an audience with, with all that we've been practicing. Because I, ha I have to say, when you're locked down the way people are, if you're truly in love with music, you, you can't stay away from your instrument. You have to go to it. It brings a kind of, kind of joy and happiness that we just need right now. So uh, we're practicing and, and, you know, and kind of um, recording and getting stuff out. It, we're, we have not uh, uh, lost momentum as far as releasing recordings. We're doing actually even a bit more than we did pre-pandemic, so. Yeah, it's Bridge Records is more than just CDs because you have DVDs, you have, uh, you have the streaming um, as well. You, you can do digital downloads. Are CDs dead? I mean, what is the future now of music delivery as, as we know it? Well, I'm sort of a dinosaur. I grew up with LPs. Our first uh, releases were LP releases. And uh, uh, I, I love the physical product. You know, it, to me, it's, uh, it represents um, a certain something that, that you don't quite get in a digital download. But uh, as far as the future goes, uh, it, it's very difficult to tell. I think there are a substantial number of people who still feel that physical product is worth having. You know, just holding it in your hand, flipping it, flipping it into the machine. There's look, something- Looking at the artwork that was conceived of to go with the project. So. Exactly, yeah. So I, I don't see uh, discs dying but certainly um you know if you look at market share they're about even for us we, at the end of the month our distributors come in with with um with sales figures and they're about equal right now Good. so what did you think about aquarelles the first time you heard the finish and saw the finished project well it's it's a beautiful record it's it's um you know uh, the music is lovely the players are lovely. It's um, yeah, the, production, as I, the production is really wonderful. Yeah, it was an easy call for us. As I say, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you you ponder and you say, "Well, the sound is not so wonderful," or they weren't covered here or something. This is this is a beautiful record. So you know, I, I will say that we have a wonderful comment from Carmen Lemoyne who says, uh, "I will. I definitely miss liner notes and other details." And, and I, I'm with Carmen on this one. I, I love the lighter notes. I love the details. And um, I also, uh, Fran Berger says uh, she loves the artwork and sends you a warm hello. So those are a couple of messages that are sent along to you. And oh, Franny, I send more than a hello. I give you a kiss. And that's across decades. I haven't seen or spoken to her in decades. Yay, the internet, you know? Happy to pass that along and so happy and honored because I've been playing your CDs for a very long time as well. And uh, they're marvelous, they're wonders, they're beautifully 
beautifully produced and they're always beautiful to look at too. So thank you very much, uh, Becky and David Starobin for joining us in, you, uh, in our webinar. It's, a, it's been, it's wonderful. Um, you can get more information too at bridgerecords.com. This is the same place that you can actually buy Aqua Rowls. And while you're, 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 you know, messing around on the website, you might find other things like the really excellent theremin CD. That's like the best. <laughs> and so uh, check out Bridge Records uh, when you can. And thank you again. Um, now I'm going to be talking to our music stars one more time uh, after we listen to uh, one last Aqua Rowls selection. This is uh, the Gig from The Suite en Concert by Jean-Michel Damas. <laughs> Jean-Michel Damas's Sweet Un Concert for Flute, Piano, and Cello, a gig from the CD Aquarelles. Our musicians are returning to the webinar now. Bonita Boyd, the flute, who did a lot of work in that movement. Stephen Doan, the cello, Barry Snyder, the pianist, and uh, Bonnie and Steve, uh, you're teaching at the Eastman School of Music, so uh, how is that going? Well, I've been teaching, we taught, we had a, an option of teaching live or online in the first semester. And I was one of those brave people who, who taught live and with a big, a big air filter and a large space. And it was a joy to be able to hear the nuance of the students and, and just was wonderful. It was wonderful. And I think everyone so much appreciated just the the ability to be together and to work together again it was very precious so that's what that's what i did and what about you steve live or virtual i was mostly virtual i must i have to take my hat off to bonnie i uh, i had a weekly studio class in hatch which was a complete delight because then i could we could be socially distanced there were only 10 of the students in town at any point but we also had somebody from china China, Taiwan, and Korea on a Zoom call during the class and sometimes playing to us. So it was, uh, but that way I got to have in-person contact uh, once a week. But I've discovered that the Zoom connections, if they're good, there's a surprising amount of detail that you can hear. And it's forced uh, those of us that are doing it that way. I think it's forced me to develop new observation tools. Um, I have, I have to ask a lot more questions like, all right, you tried this idea out. I want to know how does it sound at your end and how does it feel most, most important? Like if there's a new sensation you've given them, um, have they heard a connection between the sensation and the result? And when they do, 
they're actually teaching themselves. So it's kind of kickstarted more, uh, more of that with some of them anyway. Uh, they've been so dedicated. It's really, really quite moving because um, we're all happy to see each other, even if it's on the darn connection like that. And uh, it does mean more when you, uh, when music means more to us all right now. But Barry, you retired from the Eastman School of Music. I um, did. <laughs> what was that like the day? How long did you teach before you retired? Uh, I think it was like 48 years. Oh so my long. gosh. What was that the day you left? Was that was that a tug? Um, I'd been kind of working up to it, so it wasn't as bad as I thought. But, you know, I miss, I miss my colleagues, certainly like Bonnie and Steve. I mean, playing with them is great. And we, want, we wanted to drape the whole school in black when he left. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, he wouldn't yeah. lay that. But. Agree. But I, but I have two students at NYU, which I teach online. And uh, it's, it's, like Steve says, very challenging because of the one student who, uh, this is uh, in Shanghai, and the connections are sometimes very difficult. He tends not to listen to his left hand at all. And with the Zoom, it doesn't it doesn't sound anyway. So we don't. So he's a one. He's a right-handed pianist. So we we mostly work on the right hand, which is weird. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a challenge. And I'm I'm with Steve. You learn, you try to redo techniques and see what works. For instance, like there's a problem in the left hand. Have, have them do it two octaves higher, so you can at least hear it and see if they can do it. And and uh, you know, just you you're still keep learning and hopefully they learn. But sound is tricky. Yeah, it's difficult, but it's still fun. And I do want to say it looks like your video stopped. So you might want to click on that too. So yeah. we have a fabulous face back on, on the screen. You know, what is it, Mary? There you go. What is it that you miss about the Eastman School of Music? Well, the quality it represents. I mean, it's, it's a high level school. There's no question about it. Uh, uh, the colleagues, the kind of students, and I've heard over the years, uh, the students that audition at other schools, they like the atmosphere of Eastman. It's friendly for a big school. That's not always the case in, in other schools. So there tends to be a, a, a somewhat of a camaraderie. Of course, there's competition and so forth, but it's not as cutthroat as I've heard of other places. And um, of course, I miss my colleagues. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know that. Uh, the snow, actually, I kind of miss a little bit, but uh, I miss Wegmans. <laughs> <laughs> no Wegmans in Florida, huh? But there's, there's one in Brooklyn, apparently, so I need to go there sometime. <laughs> but I haven't been, I'm still in Florida. I've been in Florida since March, and it's hard to get back to New York because New York is difficult. And until I get a shot, it's not safe. So, uh, right. so we're, we're hanging in there. It's good. You, you know. know uh, alums and, and students, uh, people who've been uh, to the Eastman and then, you know, moved on, had told me that th they felt that the Eastman School of Music was the most humane of the music schools that they dealt with. And and uh, that really, and I've heard that more than once. So what does that, what does that mean, Steve? Why well, is I think we actively cultivate a culture of, of supportive listening. Um, I know that in the weekly studio classes that we have and all of my colleagues uh, in the string department, um, we the students have to give each other feedback and it has to be positive feedback. You have to say what really is working in a performance before you nitpick. And and it, we have to cultivate a positive attitude. And what I love is that the, I think the whole school does this and the uh, the students form tremendous bonds. You, you get a strong sense of that. And I was, when I first came to Eastman, I was, I went to Oberlin and I was very attached to my alma mater. And I was a little uh, biffish towards this big place. And it's won me over because I can sense that from the students and have uh, from the, you know, I've really increasingly sensed that over, over the last many years. By the way, I have to mention something that I think uh, also is a connection between David and Becky to Eastman. I believe Masumi Rostad, our, our new viola professor. Um, Becky, didn't you teach him at one point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, thought, yeah. I, I was actually Masumi's first teacher. I thought so. <laughs> so anyway, he's a, he's a fabulous violist and he's our new yeah. colleague. And, and uh, 
David, of course, is a phenomenal guitarist. I mean, ridiculously good. So I think could... Masumi was was four years old at that time. Just oh, for heaven's sake! Yeah. And All right. Well, excuse me. I just thought that connection was amazing. And then check out David's recorded output on the guitar. It's crazy, wonderful. Uh, speaking you. of artistry, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, I I, I want to get to to talk to you for just a second, Bonnie, because, you know, you and I have actually had this discussion. And I remember you did a backstage pass and it was in the middle of, of um, auditions and it was a particularly massive year for you. You had like 150 flute players and they were auditioning for like four places. And you talked a lot about what you look for in a student. And what's important for, for for the character of a student? I, I would like you to share a little of that. That's that's a very important question. Thank you for asking that. So I, I looking back on the years of of my students and where they are and what they're doing, it's kind of maybe born out um, what I searched for when I listen to them when they're very young. And um, they've grown into amazing artists and, and um, unique people. So when I'm listening, it's, it's especially for a, a freshman, it's different for a graduate student, but I'm gonna say for the freshman, when I'm searching, um, I'm looking first of all for that imagination and character and, and commitment and passion in their playing, not for perfection at all. So if I, I like diamonds in the rough when I find them, you know, somebody who's maybe not completely polished and completely perfect yet, but who has so much to say and so much commitment about saying it. And so when I speak with them too, I want to know what their, what their uh, vision is, you know, what, what do they want to do with themselves? How, how, what do they see? And that tells me something also about their, their motivation, their commitment, um, and and what kind of person they're going to turn into, and what kind of artist. So, so that's I think really it. And what do you look for in a student, Steve? Well, I was just making notes. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, <clears throat> but you were I, afraid I was going to ask this, weren't you? No, no, I, I was just I, I it's exactly what Bonnie says. You're looking for somebody who has a unique personal voice or is trying to get that personal voice to come through the instrument. And if, if they have a strong desire and they don't have to be, as you said, Bonnie, they don't have to be perfect, but if, if there's a strong musical uh, personality there, obviously they've got to have a terrific ear and, and physical coordination, but that's probably the most important thing. And then the character issue is really strong. You have to pick kids that are willing to fail, pick themselves up and keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And we've just been listening to some of our seniors audition for grad schools and, and they do us the honor of playing to us. And it's ridiculously rewarding because um, a lot of them are going off to Juilliard and all kinds of fancy places. And uh, that's when you know that they have, uh, they're really fulfilling their potential. Usually by the time the undergrads are in there, about halfway through the third year, you can sense them just taking off if, if things are going well. And we call it the principle of, of built-in obsolescence of the teacher. You're supposed to give them the tools and then eventually get out of the way <laughs> as soon as you can, actually. But it takes, it takes a while to get, the, to get them to assimilate that, those skills. But when you, when you hear them starting to use them, it's pretty thrilling. Uh, the letting go. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit like mini parenting. We were just talking about it today because my wife, Rosie, and I teach together and we were listening to two of our really amazing seniors um, do their auditions and uh, one le one yesterday. And that's going to be a hard crop to get rid of because they're they're ridiculous. So I know Bonnie knows this and Perry, you guys all, I think anybody that teaches feels the same way. One of my early teachers said, the ultimate aim of a teacher is to eliminate the need for himself. Yes. yes. And, and I've always thought that that that's where we're going. You know, yep. they're, they're yeah. going to become their own artist. If I've done my job well, 
I've given them the tools and, and I always talk about unlocking their golden box inside. I want to find the keys to their golden box. Who are they and what's unique about them? Um, and that's, that's the artist. Well, I want to send you greetings from Singapore, from Vivian Go, who sends greetings to all of you. And um, Francine Jacobs uh, was, is, uh, sends her best as well. And um, now that you put out one really good CD, are you ready for a second? <laughs> they have to cook up some more repertoire. There is I hear you're good at that. Yeah, there's a woman composer who we'll see about that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Barry, are you in? Uh, yes. I don't know if I want to leave Florida, but I could for a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would like uh, if everybody could please turn on the cameras and um, and so that we can look at all the wonderful people who were part of, of this webinar. Of course, Bonnie Boyd and Stephen Doan and Barry Snyder and Rich Wadi and Thomas Moore and Henrik Soderstrom, Marjorie Roth, and of course the Star Bins, Becky and David uh, from Bridge Records. Again, bridgerecords.com, the place to go for this CD. Um, and um, Thomas, it's uh, five, four productions, if I am I've got that correct. I wanna thank you all for being part of this webinar with the Eastman School of Music. It has been a wonderful hour and a half with you. And I hope that you have enjoyed your time and congratulate each and every one of you on a project so carefully thought out and, and so beautifully executed. Uh, thanks too to the Eastman School of Music and to Rich Wadi who needs to take a, a special bow because he did double duty today, not just as an interviewee, but he was the director of this production as well. I'm Julia Figueres and for this celebratory webinar, thank you again for coming and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Julia, you're amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right.